What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm your host, Ray Harkins, ever present, as always, bringing you the finest of conversations the internet has to offer. That's not entirely true, but I really try to get there. The guest this week is none other than Alan Epley. He is a singer and guitarist for a band called The Life and Times. He also previously played in a band called Shiner, which, just ask around, they're, they're legendary. They, uh, they did the whole post-hardcore thing that has been popular for, I don't know, 15 some odd years, really kind of before people really knew what they were doing with it. They did the damn thing and it's awesome. And he's still incredibly active in music and well, we'll get there. This just hold your horses, okay? Let's get some business stuff out of the way and then we will dig into the conversation. So a very good friend of the show and future guest, Bo Burchell. I know a lot of you who listen to this have some passing interest in recording and recording your own band, recording podcasts. I get emails about that a lot. So he is teaching a class on guerrilla recording, which basically means you're thrown into any situation, whether it's like recording in a living room, whether it's recording at a super professional studio. He will show you how to get the best out of your surroundings. He is teaching this class for free, zero dollars, starting on October 13th. Just go to the website creativelive.com and then you'll be able to kind of poke around and find the RSVP for this class. It's free. Just dial in. It's it's like eight hours from nine in the morning to about four in the afternoon, West Coast time. So go there, learn about stuff. I've, I've seen the course that he is teaching and it is incredibly informative. So go do that and you will become a more educated person because of it. So uh, let's get to some other pieces of business. Propertyofzack.com, 100wordspodcast.com. Thank you so damn much to those of you who have been donating recently. Robert T. from Vermont and Stuart B. from Glasgow. Thank you so much for donating. And these are one-time donations. And anytime I see those notifications in my inbox from someone who has given two, five, dollars 10 20 50 dollars to the show i can't thank you enough and basically anyone that donates to the show i'll give you a little gift just just saying and sign up for the email newsletter it is on the right side of the website i send out an email every monday that goes a little more in depth with the stories behind sometimes what it takes to set up these interviews and other funny anecdotes so go do that now a regular contributor to the show mr david anthony of the onion av club i don't even know if they're called the onion a- they're just the av club it is like the one of the best pop culture websites out there and uh, him and i got to meet in person and hang out in real life and so I occasionally bring you these conversations where we talk about very important records that have come out and important music. And we were able to do this in person. So I will bring that to you. I'll pop back in, talk a little bit about Alan and the conversation that we are about to have. And then, um, then the show will be over and then you'll go about your merry day. So here's my conversation with Dave Anthony talking about two important records you have to check out. All heavy ones. The, the, uh, we want to talk about the, uh, the Paul Bear record, uh, called yeah foundations of burden profound lore released it it sold really well initially um and we were uh we were discussing off mic <laughs> well i mean we were still holding mics it just wasn't recording <laughs> that's true <laughs> but yeah anyways you, you, were, you were talking about the uh the death heaven record and death wish releasing it and like if if that was backing it up from like a sales perspective or like where where that sat in the cultural landscape. yeah yeah because we were just kind of talking about how like you know you can put out a record that a lot of outlets like and a lot of people like and right. it gets a lot of press but maybe doesn't necessarily you know sell very well right and like that was the real curiosity for me last year with deaf heaven like somebody that got a shit ton of press great record but it's like you know you didn't know that going in yeah death was just kind of put it out like i remember ordering it at work yep. downloading it and being like this is really good and i sent it to someone who was working there who does not like black metal and was like this is awesome and that's totally. that's when i first kind of got the inkling that like oh this, this is could reach do, people yeah, do well yeah, and yeah. that and i think that's this new paul bear record not that Sorrow Extinction didn't have similar qualities. Right. Um, but I think this is, that's their, that's going to be their one. Totally. You know, the one where it gets a lot of press and people are going to see this band on tour. Yep. Check them out. And, and rightly so. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a really good record. Right. We had talked earlier about how a lot of bands in the style, you know, the big ones, like, you know, yep. thrash metal had its big four, but yep. you could easily do that for this doomy or whatever. Right. 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 Lumping in Mastodons and Baroness and, yep. and all these, 
they've largely abandoned it. So yeah, not entirely, but it changed. Right, right, totally. So like Paul Bear is coming out and just like they're kind of the new flagship of it. Totally, and I I think to me the the thing what has always separated Paul Bear from a lot of bands that are you know whatever uh, are part of that genre it's the fact like this dude can sing. Oh yeah, <laughs> and it's like there's no like there's really no bones about that where it's like the vocals are such a a focal point of the record where it's like yeah the music is heavy yeah the music is awesome but it's like wow you can sing yeah well <laughs> that was the thing is just when I even first heard them as like man like they are heavy unapologetically so yeah like, and they'll just play a song for twelve minutes that is just crushing in all the best ways. And right. then it's a guy who, I mean, his vocals, especially on the new record, remind me so much of, like, Sabbath era Ozzy. Totally. In all, I mean, that is the best compliment. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, those first four Sabbath records are unfuckwithable. Totally. And it's cool to see someone just go out there and, like, have those pipes mm -hmm. in the genre. Because a lot of times they default to the lower registers. Right. Which is cool. Like, I like that. I, I, I find it very Or they'll put a bunch of, like, you know, like a reverb or effects on it to yeah. give it more, you know, grandiosity or whatever. It's like, yeah. And, and I get it. But it's yeah. cool to see, hear a band like this where you, like, know if you want to see them live. Like, it wouldn't suffer. Totally. You know, because sometimes it can. Like, you yep. can't get that low without the reverb and some of the effects put on. And right. This just feels like a true metal band's band. Totally. You know, I, I have to imagine all those bands that I was talking about that, like, you know, the the big bands in the genre hear this and are like, well, they've got yeah, it Yeah, there's the torch has been passed, and it's like now they're able to, you know, they'll be able to, you know, break open touring opportunities where it's like, you know, they're going to do their own headlining tours for the next whatever six months to a year. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, they're totally going to be, you know, it's like, they're going to tour with OPEC. Oh, yeah. They're going to tour with these bands where it's like they're they're obviously part of the metal context, but totally blow people's minds. Absolutely. And, like, they're, they're going to be put in front of audiences that, you know, are just going to really love them. Like, my guess yep. at this moment and, you know, yeah, ballpark yeah, yeah. projection. Like, they're sure. going to they're gonna be the token metal band at Pitchfork Fest next year. Oh, uh, um, 100%. Like, totally. You know, th like, that's just kind of the ebb and flow, and that's cool. Like... I don't mean that as to be dismissive to them or to Pitchfork. No, because I uh, because Pitchfork Pitchfork will look, look like they'll have to look at that metal landscape and be like, what's going to be the most like accessible yet successful? Like you know, we can't push the boundaries too much. Where it's like you know, yeah. we're, we're not going to have a you know whatever a, a basement one man black metal thing. Exactly. Yeah. Like and, and when I when I said that, I meant that in a good way because I, I feel like the past few years they've really done a great job of putting these bands who are a little more, you know, specific to certain people in yep. front of audiences where that can just blow them up. Totally. And, and and also makes sense in the context of their festival. And I, I, I think Paul Bearer is that is that next band for them. And that's uh, yeah. cool because they absolutely deserve it. There's no question about it. Yeah. And uh it, it's it's crazy because the first time I listened to this record, it took like two and a half hours. Cause like yeah. I was at work, so I was like streaming it <laughs> and I was like shit, I gotta like go do get something. More, yeah, right, like yeah. go to the bathroom. But it was kind of rewarding because, like, I uh -huh. kept wanting to get back to it. Totally. It wasn't, it's like, oh, I've got to go to this meeting, but I just want to go fucking listen to this Paul Bear. Right, like, right, That's all right. I want to do, man. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's really cool to find a record where when I put it on, that's going to be the experience. Uh -huh. This isn't, you know, listening music. This isn't background music. Totally. It could easily become that because it's so lengthy and, and, and mm -hmm. really takes its time in certain spots. But right. It's. I equate it to when uh, David Comes to Life came out by Fucked Up. Yep. You know, a record where I would, you know, it's four sides. Right. Put on one side, really absorb that, like, go do something, come back, flip it over, put it on, and, like, you're immersed. Yep. It, it brings you into this world, and for the time it's playing, that that's everything. Totally. And, and I think it's just a, a, an amazing sounding album. Yeah. And the thing about metal that I find so fascinating is is often in, in punk, mm -hmm. hardcore, it's like that first record, man. First record's the one. Totally. In metal, it's so different to me, though. Yeah, because yeah. Because I feel like, you know, you can have the first four Metallicas, but their first record, in my opinion, is not the best one. Right. Oh, you I know? agree. Yeah, yeah, and, and, like, a lot of times with metal bands, it's like they do get better as they learn their instruments. Totally. Learn the tones. You yeah, know, yeah. Learn. learn that they can do more with, like, what their own talents may have like limited them or like yeah. they felt like they needed to be technical for technical sake. And they're like, Oh yeah, I don't need to do that. All yeah, the time. And sometimes like, they'll be like, yeah, those early records were us just string and riffs. Together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, this doesn't feel like that. And I feel like 
they're a band that can grow and they could write and, and kind of do have these shorter songs that are just as good as the 12 minute ones. Totally. So like they're working both sides of the coin. They have the ability and uh, with the success of this, potentially the ability to put out like, here's a two sided LP. These songs are 15 minutes and then yep. put out a record. That's like all three to four or five minute. Totally. You know, yeah. A, ten, a 10 song record. Micro right. version. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and not lose anything. Right. Because right. they, they didn't establish themselves as a bong ripper who I love. Right. But every song's twenty two minutes. Yep. You know, and just for yeah. twenty two minutes. It's great. They're right. killer. They're an awesome band. Right. But, you know, if they came out and wrote three minute songs, people would be like, What the yeah, fuck? What are you guys doing? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately it's cool to see a band come out still exist within their genre mm-hmm. but kind of outside of it totally yeah show show promise to break out into into so many different realms that um it's like few bands have the ability to do so yeah absolutely and, and that's what I, i'm just really excited to see how this next year mm-hmm. plays out for them no for sure um and i like i always like the juxtaposition of our records <laughs> Me where too. it's like, where we where it, where we have 12 minute long songs and then we have 45 second songs to yeah. a minute and a half. So the new, the new punch record, the new punch record, they don't have to believe was death wish put out. I've, I've liked punch for a while. Yep. Um, I never have been nuts about them. Like yeah. never was like, I was like, Oh, you know, they're like a cool kind of fast core band. I'm into this. I like that style a lot. And I, I think, you know, their records have always been good, but never great. Right. This is the first time I've heard one of the records. I'm like, this is fucking great. Totally. Um, Mainly because, like, when Death Wish released that first song, Worth More Than Your Opinion, like, that, like, mm-hmm. lyric video, it's like, one, what Megan's saying in that song is absolutely important and, right. and so topical, mm-hmm. but I feel always so, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just this, it's this raging, I mean, that's the only way I can talk about this band is it's just, they fucking rage through these songs. They do. They're they're this sounds dismissive and i I never want it to sound that way but they're not a subtle band no they are going to hit you in the face and they're going to say what they have to say yeah yeah. quickly and concisely and that is what it is but i feel like the musicianship on this record and and the way they're expressing everything is Mm -hmm. the most focused it's ever been oh for sure it was always for lack of a better word a punch yeah 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 yeah. boom uh but (laughs) but this new record is is the most powerful. I agree. It's, it's the one where they can do it once and it just hits totally. the hardest and lasts the longest. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just, it's something I keep going back to. Like, for how short it is, there are songs on here that are like, like, you know, the opening feedback. Yeah. Like, yeah. all of 10 seconds, but it's just like, fuck, I want to hear that song again. Like, it's, there, it's more, it, there, there are more memorable moments in this record that, that kind of didn't exist with their previous ones. I feel like. I agree. Um, Th- those early ones I do like. Of course, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's... Because it, they're not, like, I mean, you, 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 of course, like, people like us who, like, are, are specifically focused on records and, like, the differences between them. Yeah. But, like, we, we could play all three of these records for, for everybody, you know, all three of their full lengths, and people would be like, oh, yeah, like, that's that's the same band through and through. Exactly. Like, maybe they record, you know, I mean, even though they've recorded with Jack Shirley for the last, this LP, and I think the last one. Yeah, but, who, who's great at what he does totally you know? totally um, yeah but it's like there's there's very you know nuanced differences but the the memory like i always look especially for bands of this genre where it's like the you know memorability does that mean a word i don't think it is but <laughs> uh, memorabilia <laughs> yeah, yeah the, i think so the punch yeah. trading cards are right but i, I really think that's point. like that the, the memorable moments of this record are are they're more present as opposed to just like yeah like it's like wow that is a that is a 12 minute long lp or whatever yeah right well and that's the thing i struggle with a lot is because you know, we've talked about it before how a lot of times I find a record like this so important and I want to share it with everyone. Yep. But I, I you know, there are a lot of people I know and, and presumably a lot of people who like read stuff I write who like aren't into this. I right. mean, I'm like, this is just noise. And, you know, for me, whenever, like, I, I'm into it, I'm into this style. Right. Um, but, like, I think there's just, there's a, a real truthful, importance to this right like in, in in the de- dictionary definition of important this record feels that way to me like, yeah you know um i between this and like the perfect pussy album mm-hmm. which i think are, are addressing similar co- concepts sure and, and putting a very strong you know female mouthpiece out in front mm-hmm. of, of a band that's just 
raging. Like that's an important statement in and of itself. Totally. Um, Regardless if the music is good or not, that yeah. in and of itself has and, to happen. And right. the fact both those bands are fucking great is all the better and totally incredible live. But like, right. This record to me, I think, shows such complex and diverse emotions mm-hmm. from song to song. You know, it's an angry record. It's a right. focused and angry record. But like, you know, that first song, worth more than your opinion, like deals with this, you know, very like dealing with these concepts of misogyny and sexism and, and, and finding, you know, strength in the face of these things. Right. That I, I think is really important and, and not often seen in that light and and just even the other it, it's not even that for the duration no there are all these other topics that are explored and it's a it's very personal and it's very pointed and i just you know it's one of those things where it's like if i could sit everyone down and be like all right read the lyrics first right let's like, just read this, the lyrics right. and, and then go through it like there's a reason why bands are heavy there's a reason why bands write short fast songs right you know, you can say a lot when when you're singing really pretty. Yep. But sometimes you can say even more by having the presentation mm-hmm. match. You know what you're saying. Right. Right. So. And I always think it's it, it's so interesting too, where it's like, you know, like the punch is not you know by all definitions of the term like a full time band. Yeah. They tour when they want. They release music when they want. And to me, that's what makes bands of this nature so much more important because when they do release something. It's not because they're at the end of their record cycle. Yeah. At, like the, the sort of business trappings of the music industry have not plagued this band. Yeah. They're a band, to me, I now equate with like a Pant Black. Totally. Where it's like they're going to put out something when they have something to say. Exactly. So like when they do that, it's it's even more important. Right. Pay attention. Right. Yeah. So like <laughs> this record, um, one that maybe we'll talk about in a future podcast. It's just sure. not this band Ritual Mess that Clean Plate put out. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's essentially... Orchid. Right, right, right. It it may as well just be called Orchid. Sure. Because it's three of the four guys from Orchid. Right. Two of the guys from Ampere putting out a record that is like, doesn't really sound like, it sounds like those bands, but not like those bands. Sure. And and the stuff Jason Green's singing about on that record is, is, is in a similar way. It's like, these are dudes who don't tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are... They People, don't. They don't need to be doing this, but they are. But that's why. But there's something they have to put out. Of course. And, and those two records are very linked in my mind right now, on, on kind of different ends, but similar ends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like these are bands that don't need to put something out. Totally. These are bands that don't need to be, uh, operate in the system. Right. But because they are, excuse me, they, they are. It's even more important. It's of course. More important than the band. Who's putting out a seven inch every six months? Those bands are still important and doing great things, but like, yeah, these are the ones that kind of like make you go, Oh shit, there's a new punch record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We I'm, weren't expecting this. Yeah, totally. And 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 that's exactly how I feel. I, I think you summed it up very well with like, because they aren't a full time band, right? It makes this the statements they make, even if infrequent, all the more important, right? Yeah, because it's like, it's for people like you and I who are involved in like the business side of things, it's always, I always get lost in it. Yeah, Be- because it it is easy to feel like uh, because we are part of the quote unquote industry, it's easy to get lost in that. So it's like when I do have these things that fall left of center to it, where it's just like, oh yeah, like I, the only reason I'm buying this punch LP is because I like the band and obviously I like Death Wish. Like, yeah, and it's not it's so far removed from anything where it's just like, oh, I feel like I could check this out because it's going to be part of the cultural conversation. Yeah, no, it's not. It's going to be part of the cultural conversation in the hardcore world, but yeah, nowhere not, else, not everywhere else. And it's just right. I, because of that, it's one of those things I feel like I have to talk about because totally. because it's not going to be ever present. Right. It's like I need to do at least my part to try and make it present somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, you know, we've kind of picked two records that I think are equally as good. Yeah. In, in my eyes, very right. different. Totally. But are also receiving different treatment. 100%. You know, Paul Bear is getting, getting the hype. Well-deserved. Right. Punch is not, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try and make it. <laughs> right, right. It's like punch is so. punch is not getting the cover of Decibel, but that doesn't make it any less important. And and, and I think that's the beauty heavy music and, and the beauty of a culture like this yeah. is you can have these two things that are both important, exist out of step from one another, mm-hmm. but aren't exclusive from one another. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's 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 <laughs> fascinating, right? Uh, if you will, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I like that I said if you will too. Right, um, yeah, that's good. I like it, but but it is truly fascinating because. You know, in 10 years, history might be really kind to the punch record and it might be held up as this, like, yeah. you know, really important thing because that does happen. It so totally does, yeah. It's it's all about just, I, I think, you know, 
taking things as for what they are. Mm-hmm. Some are going to have the benefit of a push because they are a full-time band. And, of course. And they are hot right now. And the others may... It may know, take a while for that to develop, sure. Yeah, and, but it doesn't make one more important than the other because, no. you know, it's all music. It, it all has its importance if it's good. Yeah, and, totally. And that's really where the weight lies for me. Yeah. Is this a good record? Right. All right, then it's, it doesn't matter if it's a brand new band that's played five shows to nobody. Yep. If it's good, right. let's talk about it. Right. You know, let's expose other people. And, and I think these are two records, like, I would say, Punch, more alienating than mm-hmm. Paul Bearer, but... I feel like it could be potentially a gateway because of how just strong and, and how great that record sounds. Yeah, that yeah. It could, that could be the record that someone's like, I'm going to listen to Spaz. Hmm. Right, exactly. It's it. Per- perfect gateway drug. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Gotta have them. Gotta have them. Well, perfect. It's always a pleasure, Dave. Speaking Likewise, man. To you. <laughs> <laughs> so there were those two records, Punch and Paul Bear. You need to listen to them. Great music that's coming out right now. There's so much stuff that's happening in the fall. The fall is such a fertile time for awesome new music. So anyways, Alan Epley. This was pitched to me via a longtime friend and publicist. And I was like, you know what? He, I, it didn't really occur to me to speak to him about this or about him and his life. And I was like, you know what? That's a really, really good idea. I would love to do so because uh, I, I, I've never met him in person. Uh, I have been a fan of Shiner and the Life and Times for, for a while. I've enjoyed his musical output since he started. Man, was this an awesome conversation. Uh, we were just able to like really dig in deep, find out about what he does off the road, which is super interesting. Really, really insightful stuff that I think that anybody that plays in a band or is trying to be creative can take some nuggets out of. So here's my conversation with Alan, and I will talk to you afterwards. I always start these things off with just my own sort of personal entry point to uh, you know kind of what you've what you've been doing musically over the years. Pro- it was probably maybe about 2002 or 2003. I played in bands myself, toured for years, and tour managed bands as well. And was on the road with this a band called Alexis on Fire. I don't know if they that has ever. Mm-hmm. come across your sure. desk but so the the vocalist or w- the guitarist slash vocalist of that band dallas green him and i were riding in the front of the van and i was uh i'm a huge like post-hardcore fan like quicksand all that stuff is is sure. flips my switch and so i don't know why but we were just just kind of talking and he was like hey have you you ever heard shiner and i was like i was like I've, I've i've seen the band's name but i just have never checked them out he's like what the mm-hmm. fuck are you doing? And I was like, oh, okay, play, play it for me. So he puts on the egg, and then summarily my head just starts to expand, being like, dude, what, why did I miss this, man? Why did I, like, I, I just felt, uh, you know, when you retroactively get into a band that mm-hmm. has since passed, like you just feel like a fool, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> but so you're it, like and they broke up now yeah God, and damn, I, already to, and i don't get to see them if you could sort of typify a reaction of people that kind of you know whether it's obviously with shiner or whether it's the life and times being like you know the, the sort of reaction when people identify with the music is it usually that sort of like damn like i didn't like i didn't know this existed this rules like how, how does it cut it like i know from the, from the yeah. person, person interaction you know what there's a lot of that there's not everybody but for those in that vibe or, or who should have known it, didn't know it for whatever reason, there definitely is a bit of like that, you know, slap in your forehead, kind of like, God, how did I, how did I miss this? And even with Life and Times, it definitely, I get that vibe a lot. You know, we, for some reason, Shiner always flew under the radar and we tried not to. We weren't trying to be, you know, clandestine. We wanted everybody to be at our shows, you know, right. we wanted success. You know, we wanted to be um, on the same, in the same sentence as, you know, some of our peers, you know, even Braid and Hum and, and you know, in Quicksand and, and that kind of thing. But I feel like we're always, just for some reason, just a little bit behind. That reaction is common, you know? I mean, it's people, and then other people who are just like, I have no idea who that is, you know? And like, right. maybe they were just like into something else and, and um so, like, a common theme is I will see somebody and they'll go, dude, are you Al from Shiner? And I'll be like, yeah. And then they're, like, totally freaked out. And then 
their buddy staying with them has no idea and doesn't give a shit right. in one instance, and it couldn't matter any less. So yeah. it's definitely, and I think that's probably common with anybody who's you know, in a band or whatever. Not everybody's going to know your stupid band, and not everybody has to know your band, you know. Right. But um, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, but it seems like there's there were some real gaps and holes in like our reach, Shiner's reach. Like we we did have a reach, but it was all done on our own by preaching the choir. It's not as though we were able to go out with Queens of the Stone Age or Quicksand or all these different bands. We did do some cool tours, right? You know, but they were I don't know something like didn't happen. You know, in contrast, Life of Times has done a lot more tours with other bands. You know, opening for them and exposing ourselves to new people. So that's been really good. But. Yeah, yeah. Since you guys did exist in that sort of weird world of when bands start, like the, you know, the alternative boom in the early 90s kind of came and went. And then, you know, Hum is a prime example <laughs> of a band that, you know, was thrust into this weird limelight because of one song. And then uh-huh. they didn't know what, like, you know, they didn't know what to do after that because they were just the band that they were. Um, and so, and you, you guys definitely you know, f- fell into that, except not being thrust into the, oh, here's your hit single, you know, that's on the butt. Right. We never had a hit. That's the main, that's the main. Distinction. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And then, and then. For real yeah. though. I mean, it's the truth though. I mean, they, one of the beautiful things was that Hum did fall into a major label deal and we were all ready for a major label deal, like somewhere in the mid nineties and all our friends, like bands that had much less co- commercial appeal were getting deals. You know, we're getting real. So it was a matter of time. China was sure it was just a matter of time before we found the right deal. And so as a result, we were offered several deals with different labels along the way. And we were kind of like, oh, nah, not quite right. But, you know, we're going to wait till we hit a big, you know, and blah, blah, yeah. until we can cash in. And it just, so then somewhere around 98, 99, then all the offers stopped coming in, <laughs> you know. And, and then we were just like, oh. You know, oh, what do we do now? So I'm going to make a cool indie rock record with uh, DeSoto, which is the best case scenario anyway. Right. Which, yeah, it, that's that's so. interesting. So you guys, you were definitely being very picky and choosy about the the partner that you would align yourselves with because you, you had that, um, I guess, that ambition in your eyes to be like, well, yeah, we, we want a piece of that pie because we've seen everybody else kind of get that, so to speak. It, it definitely felt like that was the rug pulled out from underneath us. Um, uh, it was a bit of a, a, a dry bucket, kind of, because, you know, you get offered these things and many of your friends get dropped immediately or they don't get what should have happened. And that they're, they're ultimately jealous of our deal with DeSoto, you know, and right. and there and indeed there were other bands like we were on DeSoto with, like this Mermaid Plan, for instance, who did very well. You know, their last record, Change, was released on the same day the Egg was. So, um, but they sold, like, I, they sold very well. I think sold, I think Change sold a, a lot of records. Mm-hmm. But they also toured their ass off and did a lot of work on that. So, you know, I think being on a cool indie rock label is the deal, but you ultimately, you guys just tour a lot, you know, and, and really get it out there and, and do this. Unless you just have a hit like a big hit where it just happens to take off for whatever reason, you know, and then all these, all your festival shows are just waiting for you, <laughs> which doesn't always happen with everybody. So. Right. Right. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the culture that obviously you, you yourself and, and Shiner kind of came from was the sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, like kind of, you know, uh, whatever punk, hardcore, indie, like that was the scene that you guys were, mm-hmm. were playing to, um, so you guys had that, yeah. you guys had that backbone of, of, you know, ethics, so to speak. Uh, but then obviously you, sure. you sonically had ambitions to play beyond that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, uh, we definitely were, you know, where it came out of was definitely, uh, you know, do it yourself total vibe of, you know, it was Tim Dow, our old drummer from, you know, who he wrote Splay and Lou Lavinia and Starless with us. And then he left before we actually had recorded Starless. Mm-hmm. Um, but Tim Dow was the original one. He was like, okay, this is Jawbox. This is a band called Jawbox. You're like, really? Are they cool? Do they sell like our ears speed wagon? Or like whatever. I, I had no idea. Like, And my, my my punk rock chops were like limited to like nothing. Like when I had started this band, I knew, I knew very, very little of like current indie rock, you know? Mm. Very, very, very little. I knew Smashing Pumpkins and I knew Slant. 
and I knew like a couple of things, but I, I really, really had a very, very narrow view of what we were doing and what we were writing. And, um, and I didn't realize that it had matched up with all these other bands, you know, that we've talked about here recently. Yeah. Well, no, that's, but, um, that, that's pretty cool that you could come in. Cause usually, you know, the context for, for most bands is like, you know, you, you see your, your local scene as it were, and then you try to, you know, obviously mimic your favorite bands and, but you were kind of, mm-hmm. you were kind of coming at it from a vacuum in a way. It really was a vacuum. I mean, uh, it, you know, alternative to me was U2 and R.E.M. <laughs> honestly, it really was. Right. I got turned on to some angular chords through Paul Malinowski. He turned out to be a Shatter's bass player um, after the first record. But, uh, you know, I was, I was trying to write uh, some stuff, like you're talking about, out of your scene. And that, some of that stuff was a band called Molly McGuire. Some of it was a band called Season to Risk that Paul was from. And they both got signed to Epic and, and Sony, respectively. And so I was seeing these bands that I thought had less commercial potential. And I was like, this is ours. We're going to slam dunk this, you know? And like, and they were getting deals and, and advances and, and you know, publishing deals and all this money. And they were, uh, and that was hard to watch. But yeah, we, when I began writing, it was just in a vacuum. It really was. It was just like what I happened to like. And I think a lot of my melodic sensibilities mixed with some angular guitar parts and stuff where I wasn't really, like I didn't do a whole lot of bar chords and shit like that just because I wasn't really that good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I'd make up these kind of like, you know, open chords that I would move all around the neck, you know? And so it, it, it had a different, the songs had a different feel than a lot of just bar chord bands. Right, right. And uh, it had a sound kind of like piano parts almost, you know, so they were distorted and kind of angular. But um, So did you, at the, because you, you spent most of your, you know, developmental years, <laughs> I call it, uh, in Louisville, right? Yeah, yeah, growing up until college, it was all Louisville. Okay. Um, I lived in the south in Louisiana for a couple of years, but yeah, it was all Louisville. That was my, that's my yeah that that has su- that had such a you know a weird and rich you know independent music scene so like how did you i mean how did music start to come into your life in the first place uh i was raised my folks both are professors of music they both have their doctorate and my mom's uh organ performance and theory at this college and my dad was the chairman of the music department so i was a faculty brat you know I yeah you had, you, I, you had no choice but to play music <laughs> Exactly. So it was all, I mean, I could read music and I went to college for music. And so I, when I say I didn't know how to play bar chords, it's, like, it's an example. I mean, it's, it's extreme. I mean, I did. I just wasn't great at, you know, just shredding, you know. So I kind of was like, you know, I was a I was a performance major. I was a vocal performance. Uh, my dad's a singer, a choral conductor. And so I was always going on tour with those guys on in their choirs. I was really raised in this super music rich environment and uh still am and and uh it's it's been it's been cool it's been really cool but it, it definitely was uh different from what was going on in kc at the time after i finished college you know was, yeah people weren't people weren't talking notes or dynamics or modes or this and that which i wasn't necessarily trying to either shiner never really spoke in in oh let's do one in seven and one in eleven and one in uh 13 and all this other shit we just really weren't doing that we were writing songs that happened to have some drop beats and a couple of it here and there or whatever but we really really were not trying to be super mathy that was not our intention we were just kind of writing what we liked you know what i mean right right well it's it's interesting too because you you know when in describing your background again referencing your typical sort of you know whatever punk kid experience you know you're terrible Mm -hmm. at your instrument and you don't have any yeah. rudimentary skills at all besides, like you said, like the bar chords. And so you're coming mm-hmm. at it with like, hey, guys, so I got all this stuff and we could do it. And if other people, I'm exactly. sure I, I'm sure other people were looking at you being kind of like, yo, this dude's like, he knows a lot of yeah. stuff. He might be intimidating. Exactly. You know, I, took, I think it took the scene a little while. I had to kind of prove it because like, I had a band in town called The Industry and we were, it just was like kind of goofy, kind of 80s rock. And that was my college band, and uh, the drummer from that ended up starting China with me, and we were called Orchid for a minute, about four months. And I had Orchid played like three shows together. It was 
me and Jeff from the industry and then Sean Sherrill, the first baseman on Shiner. And we, we had to play a couple of shows before all those other dudes kind of accepted me. And, you know, they were like, oh, there's, there's Al, what's up, Al, you know. But they didn't, they didn't know that I could, that I had this and that I could create this. But we did like three orchid shows and everybody kind of got their minds blown. And then Tim Dow offered to drum for me. And I was like, dude, you know, he had kind of a, for some reason around the neighborhood, he had kind of a shitty reputation because uh, mm. he was such a badass drummer, but he was kind of arrogant or looked down on everything. But he was like, let me know if Jeff didn't work out because I'll sit in with you guys if you want. And I was like, I'll let you know, dude. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and then, so I remember we were we were pissing in the, in the stall at some bar that went to Hurricane in Kansas City. And he was like, cool, man. All right, later. And then about, I told the other guys in Season of Risk and, and that's Paul and some other guys. And uh, uh, I was like, he goes, eh, you know, Tim's kind of difficult, but it would be worth it to you to have him in the band. Just even for a couple of years, it would fall with the band. And right. I was like, eh, all right. So I did. You definitely always have those. I mean, drummers obviously are their own beast in and of itself. I mean, I think every drummer mm-hmm. in some capacity is strange or difficult to work with. So yeah, I like I like how you did the uh, the calculations in your head where it's like, you know, we could run we could run with this dude for a few years and see how it works. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that, we, well, that's if, always been the deal. I mean, you can't keep anybody forever. You know, it's just is like you know, and, and and in fact, he did end up leaving for too long. He had a couple. He tried out for failure. He didn't get the job. Kelly Scott got the job. Right after we put out a uh, display, but he kept contact. And Tim went on to play with Ken and the other rabbit. You know, right after failure broke up. Mm-hmm. But um, so I mean, he, I've I've historically played with some of the best drummers in the world. Um, I think they're all like just some of the most talented people I've played with. There's another set of drummers, you know, all of them, four or five of them now. Uh, it's been really, it's been really cool. Um, it's been a nice experience to be able to play with such, you know, talented drummers. And they, and I think they're willing to play with me because I offer material that's not just, you know, 4-4 four, four or whatever straight up you know I'm, I'm offering something interesting to kind of lean into uh, yeah because you're, you're coming at it from a different perspective rather than just like yeah just play the yeah just play the fast beat right <laughs> right and it's and exactly and, and send to the bass player you know just play the root note just play the note just play the low note put your finger on the fourth fret fourth fret no the fourth fret you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not really that you, it's you know it has to be this thing where you know we, we offer this larger there's this larger opportunity to do something more. It's not just what we've been doing for the past 30 years or 40 years right, as, right, as, right. A, as a genre, you know? So. Yeah. And so then, so then as uh, obviously as, as Shiner started to, you know, get out there and, and, and tour and sort of, you know, become a thing in uh, certain circles, um, you know, honestly, and just talking to you for, you know, whatever, 15 minutes or so, I'm sure at one point, well, let me put it this way. You don't sound bitter, like, you know, because some people have this, mm-hmm. this this weird, you know, they I don't want to talk about my past, don't talk about my bands or whatever, just because, you know, we, right. didn't get, we didn't get the attention. But I'm sure in the middle of it, like you were saying, there were elements of you being like, you had many chances to probably be bitter and throw in the towel. Um, you know, walk me through some of those, those, uh, spaces in which you were living in where it's like, oh man, I don't even know if we can do this because we, you know, turned down this contract or whatever, you know? Right. Well, there were several moments along in the Shiner, in the Shiner days that, uh, we did have opportunities and we either squandered them or passed them up. And then, you know, time passes and then somebody in the band leaves and brings somebody else in. And then all of a sudden you've been a band for five or six years in your scene and you're no longer the new guys. You get every new show to go to town, you know, early on when we first started playing. We got every show. So we built it for every cool new band was coming through because we were a local band that could control on there interesting and kind of later on you're kind of the grandfather of the band even though you're only like 28 years old you're still only you know you're only been doesn't you don't feel like you've been doing it for a while but you have and so people either lose interest or this and that so you go through different different various stages where and for us it was when Tim Down left um and we were scrambling it was we had hired Joel Hamilton who was a really wonderful engineer um who does tons of work right now in New York uh, out of a studio called Studio G. He's one of the main 
uh, moderators on the table of the website, you know, it's like big sessions with big bands. Um, anyway, Joel is, was a really instrumental in, in helping us write and finish Starless. But then we, so we brought on Jason Gerton from Molly McGuire to drum when Tim left, and then Joel left, and then we didn't have a drummer, and then it just, there were so many times when the wheels were just like coming off, and we should, you know, we should have, and, and maybe could have, we definitely could have, but maybe should have, uh, just thrown in the towel and said, fuck it, let's put out, let's just put out Starless and then start something else, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, um, Josh and Gooden. it was was it was it because of like did you find that because of like your drive or are you just a really stubborn person in general like how did I you think, know I, just, I think I'm I'm stubborn I'm not a stubborn person in general but I do have the idea through I don't know what I don't know where I got the idea but success comes to those if you just stick it through you know if you just hang around long enough people will come back there and go, hey, all right. You know, if you, but even if it doesn't happen right away, there's either the, the awards for being awesome right away and some minutes it doesn't and they fade out. And then there's the other awards that happen when you put out four or five records and people go, you know what? This body of work, their whole library of work is worth celebrating and they're badass and they're still around and I feel like you know, that's what's happening with life at times now is that we're building out a huge body of work. So, and it's being celebrated now by people who are going, fuck, I get this record and all this other, you know, and, and it's starting to be realized that it is actually impressive and there's something that's really happening. And so there are opportunities in the China thing somewhere around 98, 99, when we were trying to finish Starless. And then we put out Starless and we're on tour. Josh Newton joined the band. We hired him and he played all of Joel's parts. He kind of just copied them verbatim. We, we were mad at Joel and erased his parts and let let Josh play over him and basically play Joel's parts. The Joel knows all about it. So under the bridge at this point, so what under the bridge at this point. But um, mm-hmm. and so we put it out Starless and we set up the flagpole and instantly everybody was flipping the bird at it. Everybody was like, This shit sucks, you know, and Twitch Four gave it a fucking negative three or something. You can look <laughs> it up, it's the Starless review. It's like seriously like a three. Right. After they had come off of our last record, Lula Divinia, was very well received, and it was a, a very cool indie rock record um, that had just like done a lot as far as like forwarding our reputation. Um, and and shows were good, and people gave a shit. You know, we made a lot of strides, and then put out Starless, and it was just it still feels heavy handed to me. I know a lot of the fans really love it and there's a lot of good songs on there that I feel like are better in a live setting, but uh, I feel like the recording is like heavy handed and obvious and just kind of dumb. But um, that's my opinion and I don't want to stop on my fans. You know, I really love a lot of the songs out there. Right. Um, but I feel like in a, in a, in a better scenario that, that uh, we have used the original recordings that we did with Chef Now uh, but that's one of the bridge. But we we we, uh, we gathered ourselves and started writing. And it turns out that the songs went very fast. I decided that we need to play to our strengths, and that was we have a badass drummer, Jason Durkin from Bell and Wire, and Jason is the only other drummer in town that could have replaced Tim Dow. He really was. He's that good. He's still that good. He's amazing. Uh, it's just strong as an ox, light as a fast as a gazelle. Uh, super musical, uh, like I can't say enough about Jason Summit. It, it's still, it's just like it's it's surgical how how precise and amazing it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a little side note, Molly McGuire is putting out a new record, and I just sang and played guitar on a new song, so that's been really refreshing. To be able to oh, do nice! That. But uh, around the time of the end, I, I was like, I just realized, I recognized that we needed to play to our strengths and stop trying to be Radiohead or Failure or all these other bands that we were hoping to be and just do them, um, just be us. And so uh, the song started coming very easily. And it was always a deal where I would play by myself with my little amp. And I'd get two or three or four sections together for every song and kind of bring them in and, and present them. You know, I'd have a couple of ideas for this and that or whatever, maybe a drum beat or this and that. But they fell together pretty quickly. And it started to have a theme. The whole record started to have a kind of like uh, an overarching theme. And uh, so that's why I feel like um, we kind of came in. There was a reason that we salvaged this. It wasn't that you know, there was a couple of years there where 
I was like, why the fuck are we doing this? You know, this sucks. Let's just start a new band, you know? And like, um, right. Uh, people well, weren't excited, you know, in those earlier years, but then when we came around and some of the early stuff in the egg started to come around. Yeah. And those early singles, people were starting to freak out. And we got them offer to go tour Death Cab, and we did some other cool tours. And, and were you kind of by default the, the business guy of the band, or was there uh, or were there other people that helping you along the way? Uh, I was the business guy. I was band manager, songwriter, singer. I was kind of an everything guy. Uh, Paul was our engineer. Jason was our amazing drummer. And he only asked certain things from certain people. Josh Newton added a lot. He added a lot. And he played a, a second guitarist role so well because he knew when to shut up and when to just add accents. And, like, he, he, we, we complemented each other very well, even though our personalities weren't always online. He's mercurial, and he would even admit to that. And we've, we've since, you know, you know, worked everything out, but, um, I was material too. So, but, um, what Josh added was accents and depth to the recording, um, and to the band without just doubling my parts. It wasn't about that. We didn't want a double. We wanted to create a, a job oxy thing or something, you know, where it was like Jay and Bill playing off of each other or, you know, that kind of thing. And we really did. And uh, so the tours and everything and the reception for the egg was really, really great. But, you know, compared to, let's say, the Dismemberment Plan record, which came out the exact same day, we were on the exact same card that Kim sent out to everywhere. One time was the Snowland, the other time was the end. But I know Dismemberment Plan sold shit tons of records, whereas, you know, ours didn't sell so well. You know, back then, you know, it's selling a lot well than records do sell now, but. I mean, I don't even know how many we sold. I think we were so disappointed by the sales that we didn't keep track very much. Now we get quarterly statements, which are pretty cool. Right. For, for Soto, she continues to find all of us and make sure we all get paid. All of her bands get, you know, quarterly statements from her, which are really generous and very, very cool and, and a nice acknowledgement that we were doing some good stuff. And it's like in the way that you're describing, you know, obviously, like you said, your your persistence and your willingness to kind of keep things, you know, going. It sounds like, have you built your life around the idea that, okay, like, I know that I can potentially make money off of a band and like make a living off of music, but that's not going to be like, I have to do that rather than, um, you know, a lot of people who it's like, well, the band is going to be my thing and I'm not going to have anything else going on. So like, I presume you've been like, you know, working jobs all, all, all during, a, you know, this time and kind of creating a lifestyle in which you can always, you know, pursue music rather than, um, you know, do it for a few years and then it kind of burns out. Right. Um, yeah, I, that's been a constant kind of, uh, point of contention in my own existence in life. I mean, it is, it's, so many of my friends are, you know, would do this for a while and then they would just like stop completely and then go do something in a job that they feel like they need to their wife or their mom and dad were asking. And they're like, okay, this is cool. When are you going to, okay, cool, get on with it. And so uh, throughout the whole thing, I continued to work like service industry jobs and I taught guitar at my old college for a long time. I had a full, I had like 35 students at one point in Kansas City. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's this whole deal between making money through this or or, or making money at a, at a job that's, you know, maybe you're in IT or something. Maybe you do any other job, you know. Um, the whole thing for me was that life is short. It's a lot shorter than you think it is. And uh, even though it seems the days are really long, it seems like but the, the years pass very quickly. And I saw people's, I could see, in third person people's lives kind of slipping away from them and then trying to get back into music and then they try to start a band again and it sucked or or, or nobody cared. And so mm -hmm. I felt like I had a certain jewel in my hand. And when I came to, you know, sometimes there's just not a whole lot of rhyme and reason to why I've stayed with it. And some of it is that, I don't want to say I'm not skilled for other jobs than I am. I can do other things. And, I, you know, I've, I've done many jobs throughout my life in order to facilitate this. But... Um, so it was just like life is short and I need to do this now while I can. I probably won't want to, you know, here in 10 or 15 years. Um, turns out I'm still doing it, of course. But, uh, <laughs> I, uh, um, but I'm, I'm able to make money now. 
making music, and I my job now here in town is um, I play with the Blue Man Group in Chicago. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a blue man, but I play in the band. I'm one of the musicians that play Chapman's too, with the blue oh, man group. Okay. And so it's a really wonderful gig. Um, and pays well, and I play with some of the best musicians in the world. Uh, they're all Berkeley and grads and University of Miami and North Texas, and it's all it's a super high-level gig that's really fun and allows me to tour. Do they do they have uh, do they have any context for the you know like obviously the world that you come from like you know here here you are a you musician firstly but then obviously this this guy that's you know toured in vans for years and you know kind of built built a small thing on his own um, do does anybody have any context for that like if you're you know trading stories one night after a show mm-hmm. or something like that. Some, some, some people do. When I started there, I think I might have, I got asked to audition because they knew who I was, because one of the guys knew who I was. Um, and so I got the gig, but then many others, like, it's really <laughs> humbling in a good way, because there's a bunch, like I say to you, I mean, one guy, when I was saying about why I meet people, it's like, one guy's like, fawning, can't believe that I'm here in front of him, and then another, then the other person's like, whatever, you know, you can talk to this guy or whatever. Right. So some of the deal was I showed up and everybody in the band there is like a badass. Like there was the people who were who were there are less impressed with me as like some indie rock guy that people you know that I think people should know and they're just like like hey this is Aaron you know it's cool oh you you have a band cool awesome you guys went on tour. Cool, man. Right on. We'll see you guys keep back. Cool. They don't, you know, they don't know necessarily or care. It doesn't matter to them because everybody there has a band. Like Tom Ray was Nico Case's bass player. Nick McCree was in, he was in Heroic Doses and Sea Clamp and he played for Liz Fair. And okay. um, the other guys all play with many other successful groups and bands. So I'm just kind of like one of many, honestly. It's well, it's. I mean, it's cool because I. I, I mean, I, I think the 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 real thing is just kind of the culture and experience of obviously being in an indie band that you know it doesn't have a lot of things going on for themselves besides their own music and gumption to kind of make it happen. So you know, walking into a structure like the Blue Man Group and being like, "Hey, so I'm this guy that's like you know that I, I've done other stuff. Like, hopefully, someone will understand where I'm coming from." But the other people do have that similar experience. Yep. It's it has it has it has been that, um, and, and other people did have that experience. Um, it's been nice though because I've I've been able to like earn it in another way because those people don't didn't know China they don't know life and times. But then after a while, some of the blue men, some people who work there, will come out and see a show and they will get their minds blown and they're like, "Dude, I had no idea you guys were like a badass band and people showed up to your shows and shit." You know, I'm like. Yeah, man. Right. I, you know, I, I don't want to like flaunt anything or whatever. But, right, you're not going to be your own hype man. Right, exactly. But when that when it does happen now, and they're seeing a guy who's forty something years old who's out there playing rock shows, you're like, really? You know, I have kids <laughs> and my wife here, and they're like, but then they see that's actually something for real, you know, and actually not. I'm not just phoning it in, and I'm not just doing some nostalgia act, and I'm not just, you know, I mean, the tour we just got off of is amazing, you know. And, it was, the shows were very well attended every night, some more than others, but there it was always a few hundred people there. It was yeah. all like the merchandise was great, the guarantees were great, and the tour was awesome. And you could only we all came home with money, and, and like you know, bands go out on tour, and that doesn't happen. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like um, so I don't take any of it for granted. Um, what I I do feel like music has missed out on having me on uh, on like some talk show at night, you know, like it would be great to be on Seth Meyers show or something, you know, or the, sure. the Fowler show or any one of those things that I've seen many of my friends on and people that I know who are in dog shit bands who are on right. there, but for one reason or another, their label got them on or whatever. And like the, the music guy for Fallon, his name's um, Jonathan, I don't know his last name, but he's a big fan and always tweets these things whenever we put on a new record. And he's like, you know, he would have us on if he could, but there's there's a larger structure involved that there's more politics involved in order to get us on the Fallon show than just 
that the music guy likes us, you know. So it's one of those things. The chips didn't fall appropriately, but you know, you can uh, right. obviously, obviously, like you said, you your your focus is that the body of work speaks for itself. And I mean, I think ultimately, like I said, it's it's. I was honestly nervous in taking this conversation because I was like. You know, last thing I want to exemplify is is you know uh, a, a, some a, a a bitter shell of what a person used to be, <laughs> and not saying that you exemplify no, that. No, I hear that. I wouldn't be doing this if I was bitter. I mean, I, cause I don't it's have true. to be doing this. There's no like I make plenty of money in my jobs here in Kansas City. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm starting. I make plenty of money, and I don't have to doing this by any stretch. And so. I would hate for people to think that I was like in some contract or it's like, I don't know how to do anything else. Now I do this because we fucking love it. You know, I mean, and we love being together, me and Eric and Chris, and we love to play together. And you just don't get an opportunity in your life when you have something that works like such a, a well-oiled watch machine, you know, like, like when we're at our best on stage in front of a bunch of people and it's like, we're like this top spinning in the middle of the floor, you know, at this high speed. It's like, you don't get that in your life all the time. And to be able to show off in front of a few hundred people every fucking night is like, it's just like, it's a, it's a special deal. And they pay you to do it, you know, and they, yeah. and they tell you you're awesome. You have to go out there and like, like if, you, if, you, if I was on tour, like, with, like if I was playing in the Stone Age, you'd be hard to get me up and home, honestly. You know, I'd bring my family out on the road with me. Because right. every night you've got 10,000 people screaming your name and, throwing money down your neck. You just sort of like, it, it would be, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, the opportunities to like, to play and to perform with some people that with whom you play so well, that's a rare and special thing. And, and yeah. it has to be embraced in what is ultimately a short life. You know, I mean, yeah, we're all supposed to live 85 years or 90 years or something, but many people, I've had a friend of mine from the industry, Joe Hart, died the other uh, two weeks ago or Mm -hmm. a month ago, and so me and Jeff, the first drummer from China, when we were Orchid, played at his funeral. And this is somebody who's 44 fucking years old. He should have lived yeah. forever. If you don't do this shit and do it now, then it, the opportunities don't really exist later on, quite honestly. Yeah. You don't. I mean, yeah, you can get better and play with some buddies and do some things, but the chance to go out and show it off, travel and to see the Northwest and all this, you know, and that's something that I don't take for granted. And it's not just about money or fame or, or recognition and that. I do want those things. I do want money and I do want people to know what we've done. And I don't, but I would still have my awesome little house here in Evanston and I have my family and my wife teaches and it's like, I love this life, you know? So I'm getting the best of both worlds. I'm able to like be a dad and be in Blue Man Group and like, but I also go on tour, you know, but it's not all the time and it's, I live a very rich life. Um, right, right. So yeah, you got, you have nothing to be bitter about, which is, yeah, I mean, that's that's ultimately right. the love of music has been your barometer. And, you know, fortunately, it's been able to, you know, get yourself in, again, get yourself set up in a situation that you, music is still at the core of what you do. And that's ultimately Absolutely. the biggest the biggest takeaway. That's exactly right. When you were shifting between, you know, obviously as Shiner was kind of coming to an end and then, um, you know, every, every person who's ever played in a band that is, you know, of relatively serious has those moments when the transition out of band life into sort of, you know, quote unquote, the real world, uh -huh. um, you know, it's, it's terrifying. And I'm sure a lot of people kind of hit that wall and like, don't know what to do. Um, did that ever occur to you where it was like, you know, once Shiner was coming to an end, like, Oh man, like I, I know I'm sure you had it in your head where it's like obviously you wanted to start another band, but yeah. um, you know, was th was there that fear of like, oh man, like how how am I gonna jump out of this? Yeah, I mean no I never really went into um it was a kind of business where you might look around your cubicle your cubicle and go, Oh man, what what have I done? you know, or or I have to go do this now. It was never that kind of scenario. Like I say, I was in the service industry for so long at this pizza restaurant and then I was and then I started teaching guitar for five or six, seven years at the end of China. Um and so that was nice. You know, I so I could see myself kinda of always being a musician in some way I kind of like you have this rough, you know, kind of fuzzy image of what you think you might do and might be into. Um and, and mine always kind of ro rotated around music in some way, either teaching or writing, you know, and creating scores or recording other bands. 
Um, and luckily, I've done all of those things and continue to do all those things. Um, I have three sessions. Um, Eric and I have been there for legend times. Are recording three separate bands in October alone. You know, so it's like it, uh, that side of it is picking up. And I uh, just scored a documentary for the Hazard Planetarium here in town. And so that went very well. Also, uh, we had a big premiere down at the Adler. And Adler is a really wonderful Chicago institution. Been there for a million years. Literally a million years. And, right, right. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Again, I mean, again, it goes back to the point you were making earlier in regards to the fact that, you know, yeah, it's it, any time a person makes a transition in life, it's, you know, there's some fear and trepidation, but you're just like, well, at the bed of it, like, I know I'm going to be doing music. That's right. kind of, that's kind of right. it. Exactly. And I, and I kind of said, okay, worst case scenario, I'm going to be fine because I've got this and, you know, at the end of the day, I'm holding my guitar, you know, it's like I'm making money by playing music. That's, I've won the lottery like that, you know. I think it's a, it's a matter of, you know, perspective because many of the bands that also got signed and I was jealous of are in worse positions now. I mean, yeah. you look at them all now and, and none of them saved their money and bought houses or maybe one or two of them did, you know, and, Thomas had some good day outs throughout the years for like the Cadillac commercial that, and they've all been kind of in the situation that I have and, and that they're a little bit reluctant rock stars, but you know, they've taken money and they've done some cool things. They, I don't think they've taken advantage of it. Like I feel like I would have, um, you know, they, they want to have a life. They want to have a family. They want to have, they want to, they want to cook out. They don't want to, have to, you know, it doesn't. They don't have to be rock stars per se, quote unquote, because that's as it goes along as the rock genre and the, and the idiom as that moves forward over the fifty or sixty years we've been doing this since the, since fucking Buddy Holly or whatever has been, you know, is that that rock star image is a false image. You know, I mean, it doesn't really exist. Nobody's cool all the time. Nobody's a rocker constantly. Sometimes you got to change a diaper. If you want to have a, you know, and we've seen those older rockers around town who are still trying to be, trying to look too young and wear clothes that are not, you're like, come on, dude, really? You know, right. you know those guys, and, and they're like 50, and they're still like hanging on to like what you know, a rock star is about. You're like, dude, you look ridiculous. Just, you know, continue to make music, but do it in a way that's... Age appropriate. That's age appropriate, exactly. So I, I think that's just my biggest mission is to try to make music that is as relevant as I can make it for my fans and even this larger genre of things where, like, I don't want to play nostalgia shows. I don't want to just play to a bunch of old dudes. I don't want to just play to, like, you know, I mean, I want to, I want I want there to be people, you know, and kids. And there are kids at our shows. There's high school kids that are playing a show tonight. It's all ages. So, and, and they know Shiner, and they know Life in Times. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, that's gratifying for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no way I'm going to get around where they don't know I'm some 40-year-old dude, you know? I, I'm okay with right. that. But there's also a bunch of other fucking bands that they all like that are also 40 years old, like all the guys in Queen of Stone Age or whatever. And You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. just for instance. But, um, and let's say Weezer's all older than I am, and Sonic Youth is older than I am, and all the fucking Get Up Kids are older than I am, and all of... It's right. like... It, it, it's all perspective, and you can continue to make relevant, cool music, but just don't act like a twat, and don't be... You know what I mean? Don't be... Uh, yeah. Don't try to be too... No, no. You know, it, it's very transparent. If you're trying to have too young, I'm just out here doing our show, and if you throw down, if you will write, really, from your ass and from your heart, and write great music and make sure it's killing and play to your strengths, then it will, they will respond. And they have been. Mm -hmm. That's which is what this new record is about. It's like, I have no business doing this. I don't have to do this either. I don't, you know, I don't know. Require, I mean, we do need money from it, but it doesn't, it's not part of my, you know, I don't count it as part of my taxable income per se. And we make, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year from the band, but it's also like something that's kind of like under the books, you know, beyond the books. But right. it's also like something that if, if you do it right and play hard, people will respond and get their fucking minds blown. And we do, and we can tap in. We played 10 shows this past time, and I would say six to seven of the 10 shows, we were able to kind of zone everything out and lean in. And there are certain moments of like complete set when we're on stage, when people are just getting, when we're taken away, and as a result, 
people are infinitely taken away. It sounds so cheesy to say, tear from your heart, or, or just, right. just really do it, blah, blah, blah. And the, 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 what they're trying to say is, if you believe it and lay into it, and it's truly that if you work hard on it, it's awesome, it, people will respond to it. And that's sure. not been the case. It, they have responded, and people are getting their minds blown. And we just wanted to not make a lateral record, a lateral move. We wanted to move forward and make something that was interesting and Exciting, you know. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, it seems like, I mean, especially with obviously what you've done with with the life and times, it's like there's a through line with each record and EP. Um, but yeah, there's just different. Uh, you guys explore different sonics with or different qualities in which the band has exemplified. Whether it's like you know focusing on you know the atmosphere on one record or whatever. Sure. So it's like it's yeah, you do enough to keep yourself engaged, but at the core of it, like, you know you're going to be getting a Life and Times record, just slightly different, but not different enough that you're going to bum people out because, you know, that's not what you need in your life right now. That's exactly right. I'm, I'm here to move things forward. I'm not going to put out an electronic record. People are expecting a Life and Times record, but they don't want the exact same Life and Times record. They want to move forward a step or two. And it, and it does. And it's, this might have been a step or two more than what they were thinking, but it's still a Life and Times record. And every record it seems so far has been this kind of like forward, forward, but it's just kind of leading them where we were thinking, you know. But yeah. uh, that's that's the most the, important thing is to make it relevant for us and, and for the listener and for you know. So we're not making throwback rock. We don't want to make throwback rock. And I realize some of it's going to be like, oh, it's totally nineties, but it's like I don't feel like this is a nineties. It's nineties in the sense that we're playing rock music and not not some rock music with a wink, you know, some like noisy like fake punk rock or some shit that's got a wink in it. Although there, there is some good punk rock, there's good noisy psych rock and shit going on right now. But I feel like yeah. there's also a lot of like really not great music or, or you know, but, um, well, it's what, what I find interesting too is, I mean, obviously all music is cyclical and it's like, now you see a, a you know, a very, devout scene of bands of uh, that are made up of kids between the ages of like you know 18 and 23 totally aping everything that was happening in the early 90s because uh, of course it's been yeah it's 20 it's 20 years old so of course people are going to reference that so it's like yeah you have bands like you know balance and composure and super heaven and like all these bands that you know are playing riot fest in your hometown um and it's it's interesting because it's like you you know you the life and times could easily play with those bands on stage and no mm-hmm. one would bat an eye. No, no, no one bat an eye. That's exactly right. It just is in the packaging and in the fact that they're actually, that they're eighteen years old, you know, whatever. And so I, I get that, and, and that's cool. And I do know things are cyclical, and and I'm and that's fine with me too. That things come back around later. I have a good life, and what can I say? You know, I'm like, do I want to be on the main stage of Riot Fest? Of course, who doesn't? You know, but that's not always the case. Right. We've done tons of great festivals and continue to get great offers. We have a wonderful booking agent. You know, I, I guess I just am totally like trying to look at things through the positive lens. There, there's obviously elements of justification that everybody has in their lives, whether it's like, okay, like, yeah, I, I, I don't have this, but then, you know, I do have this. But the the fact that it's like, if you've had certain experiences, like, you know, once you've played whatever, a festival, like, there's not much that differentiates it from one to another, you know? You've had that experience, and that's mm-hmm. kind of a thing, as sure. opposed to never having experienced anything like that. And that's, yeah, you, you're coming at it with a balanced perspective as opposed to like, oh, like, because everybody will look at what they don't have. Uh-huh. Everybody can do that. But then that's it's a- like to actually be able to look at what you do have, that's that's the key. Oh, yeah. that's a, And that is it. And that, that totally is my perspective. That's a, that I deal with many bands and some of my blue man brethren are just like, you know, they have like bands that you wouldn't fucking believe are so badass. But they would but they need a booking agent and they need this and that and a fan and the other and they don't and they don't have these things and, and I don't know, I and to go on tour and make money and to have a fan base and that's international and like it just is I, you know it is you're, the way it's gone and I have embraced it. You know, it's like for whatever reason I don't necessarily believe in, in destiny. It's just that brings all kinds of other, you know, theological questions along with it, you know. But um, I, I just, I can't hate on where my life is at. My my young son and my young daughter and my beautiful wife and our, and our awesome house that we own here in Evanston. Um, 
and like my jobs and like all of this. It's just like I feel like I won the fucking lottery. Honestly, I continuously feel like that. So right, like, right. I, I really don't spend any time, you know, lamenting what, what, what could have been. Yeah, I really, I really don't. I just am working positive, you know. That's spectacular. Well, I, I don't think there's a more appropriate place to put that cherry on top of that. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for hanging out. So there you have it, Alan Epley. Go check out The Life and Times. Go dive into the archives in regards to Shiner. Just get get the record called The Egg. That is just unbelievable. And from there, you'll be able to dive deeper into the catalog and you'll just you, you will be a, a better person because of it. I'm just I'm just gonna go ahead and say that. So thank you as always to Tom Richfield, our editor and producer extraordinaire. Thank you to propertyofzach.com. Visit 100 wordspodcastcom and uh, sign up for the email newsletter. I'm not going to tell you the guest is next week. Keeping a lot of stuff under wraps. You got to sign up for that email newsletter if you want to. You want to get the juice beforehand. So there you go. Until next week, be safe, everyone. Uh-huh.